Good morning. I'm Lana Costantini from the San Francisco Historical Society. I have with me today Jim Shine, owner of Shine and Shine Maps in San Francisco. Jim is here to talk with us about his new book, Gold Mountain Big City, which is based on a 1947 illustrated map of Chinatown. Jim, welcome. Thank you, Lana. It's nice to be here. And hi, San Francisco and fans of San Francisco through the San Francisco Historical Society. What a treat it is for me to be here. One of my favorite organizations. I've been a member for many, many years. And I uh, do these uh, not just to promote my book, but also for the promotion of these um, social and historical organizations. They are paramount at this time that we support them. And uh, I'm very happy to be here and do what I can. And I hope you'll do the same. Uh, today, uh, I've been invited to discuss uh, a new book uh, written by me and published by Cameron Press, uh, released in March of 2020, just in time for us all to go into shelter and read. Uh, the book is about Kenneth Cathcart, a, a newly transplanted San Franciscan uh, from 1937, uh, who wrote a book uh, uh, about, excuse me, who wrote maps. Uh, well, let me actually clarify. He was a failed author and he tried to write books and they turned into maps and he produced seven maps between 1946 and 1955. Um, the book I've written, Gold Mountain Big City, addresses Cathcart and his maps and where they came from and what they were about. The uh, map of subject is San Francisco's Chinatown and environs. And I'm going to do a bit of a screen share here and we'll go through a, a PowerPoint of about 150 slides or so. Um, maybe we'll do the abbreviated version, only do 120 slides. Uh, either way, uh, we'll get a good synopsis of the story of the book and what Cathcart's goal was in creating both the map and all of his maps. So with a quick screen share, we're going to jump into my PowerPoint and turn it into a slideshow. And here we see um, the title of the map uh, written in Chinese characters um, with some modifications. Uh, that say Gold Mountain Big City. That is uh, one of the names for San Francisco for the Chinese American community, the immigrant community, um, who started coming to San Francisco in 1848. Uh, the story uh, in the book, essentially uh, through the introduction in the first chapter, addresses uh, some of the technical aspects of the maps and the collection and where it came from. It's a story of San Francisco and San Francisco's North Beach neighborhood and the purchase of a collection uh, from a neighbor uh, who we'd met through a local business. And when we opened our store, she approached us and said, we should buy this collection. Well, upon investigation, we found her basement was filled with maps, uh, hundreds of them, literally, and we bought the entire thing. And with it came uh, a collection of photographs, close to 3,500 negatives in 40 millimeter commercial grade and 35 millimeter commercial grade acetate negatives, um, which were used uh, upon discovery and research to uh, research and create maps about San Francisco. Uh, we went through this collection that we had purchased and found two piles. One pile was a pile of reference material, and the other pile was the materials that were created by a single individual, a man by the name of Kenneth Cathcart. And Cathcart moved here upon our research discovering in about 1937 at 35 years old and settled uh, in San Francisco uh, to become an author. Uh, his inspirations were people like Charles Doby and Arthur Sidham, uh, people who created works about San Francisco and its history. Uh, for us, the maps represented that he created represented um, uh, uh, an experience of, of many San Franciscans when we're either raised here or move here uh, in the immersion in San Francisco culture and some of the inside jokes and the culture that preceded us historically. Uh, Cathcart was an aficionado and a fan of this, it turns out. Um, we uh, took his collection and sorted it, and by 2016, uh, created a reprint of one of the maps. We chose the Chinatown map because it was so cryptic and unfamiliar to me relative to some of the other histories, and many of the stories, although the icons were familiar, I didn't know, and I thought it would be exciting to research those. Um, we reprinted uh, a map that was created from a sepia tone artist proof. Uh, that map uh, then became uh, a lithograph, which we sold out to store. Uh, the process uh, is explained in the book, uh, a process of taking a sepia tone artist proof and hand watercoloring it, and then having it scanned, and then having that scan photoshopped, digitized, and cleaned up. And that process took us a year or more, 2015. And, uh, and at the end, we had a marvelous map. 
And then we started to look at the map and really wonder what it said. Uh, so we started deciphering it, and in 2016, 2017, we started to uh, write about the map, and 2018, searching for a publisher, uh, in 2019, finding Cameron Press and ultimately producing the book um, through editing down a 450-page manuscript with over 600 PDFs and images and photographs into a 150-page book with about 300 images and, P and PDFs. So uh, that was kind of the process and, and the synopsis of the introduction to the book, the first chapters. Um, the book itself is about this map. And here we have San Francisco Chinatown and environs, a scrapbook map. Scrapbooking is, as it sounds, it's the idea of uh, drawing something rather large, uh, cutting it out, uh, putting it on a background, photographing it, photolithographically reducing it, uh, and piecing these things together as a scrapbook. All of these images on this map would have been drawn individually in a six by eight inch scale, uh, and then reduced to create an overlay onto the map to create what we see today. Very archaic, very time consuming. Uh, here we have chapter one, and we start with our map maker. And here's a self-portrait, something not too common, but not too unusual, but interesting. Uh, this is Cathcart in about 1942 in the middle of the war. Uh, and it's a selfie in his home, in his mother's home in Sacramento, where he's visiting for Christmas time. Uh, Cathcart is a great documentarian. Here we have uh, the first day uh, newspaper. It's the first day with his new Leica camera. And it's exciting because it's almost archetypical art student stuff. Here's a man that's 35 years old living in his newly acquired apartment on the 1200 block of Pine Street, essentially a refitted flat where he's got the back kitchen and dining room that has his flat within the flat. Um, and he's received a Leica camera. And we didn't know when, except for when we blow up this photograph, we find that the San Francisco Chronicle is dated for December 26th, 1937. It's the day after Christmas. And with his new Christmas gift, he's documenting the purchases and the things that come with it. And it's a developing kit and all the accessories and accoutrement to support photography. It's also interesting to point out that here in the middle of the photograph is an aluminum film vial. These are the exact film vials which I still have in my possession, um, which were handed off to me when we purchased the collection, all each individually marked with their content in regards to subject matter. I have about 110 of those such vials uh, in a case that were given to me. So uh, here's his new day, new city, new camera. This would be December 26, 1937, looking down California Street to the west, where the cable car turns right onto Hyde Street, heading north. A familiar sight to many San Franciscans, a bit changed. We see the poor air quality, very similar to what we're having of late with the fires. This would have been the period of the 1930s when we're burning diesel and dirty fuels, and that would have been our air quality. We also see a radio antenna there, kind of interesting. Uh, at the beginning of 1938, Cathcart, uh, through his pho photography, announced himself as a commercial photographer available for rent. And a man by the name of B.S. Fong hired Cathcart in February of 38. And the records show that aside from having uh, Cathcart do family portraiture of both himself and his family and other members of the community, um, B.S. Fong is the president of the six companies, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, otherwise known as the six companies, a predominantly Hong Kong based six family organization that was the center of Chinatown community and one of the few liaisons between Anglo white European America and the Chinese community from 1848 on well into the 1930s. The importance of the six companies is well documented. After um, <clears throat> excuse me, at the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War. This is prior to the Second World War and the Americans joining it. Um, but at the time when the Americans are supporting uh, the Flying Tigers, uh, a Chinese air squadron fighting Japan in Manchuria, uh, this is a time when uh, Chinese Americans are raising money to support relief for the communities in Manchuria suffering under Japanese uh, aggression at the time. This is just prior to the Second World War, and the Chinese are pretty much on their own on this, and that America is in the middle of the pacifist movement for the most part. And uh, interest in the war and participating is very light, and the suffrages of 
of the Manchurians are not necessarily paramount, but the six companies has felt it is, and they've hired Cathcart to, in fact, document the meetings and the events of the CCBA and all the supporting um, uh, entities, which would range from talent shows to fundraising in the community. Here's a picture of, uh, of the six companies meeting space uh, with uh, pictures of uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek in the background. These would be the leaders of present-day Taiwan and the Chinese Republic, a democratically structured republic based on Sun Yat-sen's constitution. These were paramount to the central uh, ideas of the Chinese American community in Chinatown at this time. And the support of democracy and freedom within China is the backbone of the conversation that's being represented by Cathcart and his sponsors, B.S. Fong and the six companies. Um, the collection of uh, donations for war relief, uh, special events. Uh, this is the Chinatown Harmonica Band, uh, probably the YMCA Harmonica Band. Um, these are marvelous events that are used to promote uh, an interest in war relief for Manchuria. But it also facilitates life on the streets for Cathcart. And Cathcart has the privilege of a very, very reputable and respectable host in B.S. Fong. He's not just the president of the six companies, he's a uh, operating merchant. He's the representative of Delta Airlines and United Airlines in Chinatown. He's also the leader of the LFK, the Louis Fong Kuang Sui Sing Family Association, a very important association on the corner of Clay and Grant Street and a big member of the merchant community. So with his host, Cathcart is having the privilege of meeting people and having an introduction in his new adopted city of San Francisco from 1937 really well into 1945. Um, with that comes a documentation of the community as it was at the time, the members of the community, the local businessmen, the shoeshine kids. I recently got an email from someone who has identified one of these children as her father, uh, which is a great joy. And if you have any such experiences with both the book or the photographic collection online, we do ask that we hear from you and that we're trying to fill in the blanks and that these are our parents and great grandparents and grandparents that we're seeing in this imagery. And it's important to continue that chain of continuity in regards to who they are. Um, we also have, aside from just the general members of the community, we have very respectable newspaper men like Xinhua Li, um, who has China Digest and freedom of speech and freedom of press, a democratic press is very important to Chinatown at this time, as well as representation. We see that through B.S. Fong, Cathcart has been introduced to Stidger and Stidger, they have an office in 240 Suite 240 in the Montgomery block, 628 Montgomery. This is the place where Cathcart is then invited to also have an apartment. And from 1938 till 1958, this is where he lives, also known as the Monkey Block. The Montgomery Block was uh, a facility that in 1854, when it was built, was the first fireproof building in San Francisco. But by 1938, was a center for the Bohemian and the artist. And there were over 75 working artists, authors, painters, and creators with WPA or other subsidies living and working within this building at this time. Cathcart was not one of those subsidized artists through that program, but indeed did have a subsidy, which is explained in the book. The building itself is a centerpiece for the reasons that Americans flocked to San Francisco for the arts community in the middle of the 20th century, um, the reasons that the beatniks wound up in North Beach, and tangentially why the hippies wound up in Haight Street, can all really trace its roots back to this building and its community. Um, present site of the Transamerica Pyramid, another paramount uh, landmark. But in its time, the Montgomery Block was the place, and with it came all of the trappings and accessories um, of its history, including uh, the fact that this is where the Bankers Exchange was and where Duncan McNichol invented Pisco Punch, a favorite of San Francisco. And ultimately, that recipe remained uh, active in this place from 1853 until 1918, the plaque says, and it would have indeed been June 30th, 1919, the last day of legal drinking prior to prohibition. And we see closing night of the Bankers Exchange, uh, some sad cops, some sad trolley drivers, some sad bartenders. Uh, it is uh, through this that Cathcart, in fact, uh, the man on the far right was a man that Cathcart interviewed and had 
documentation with and learn the recipe for Pisco Punch, and we have that in, uh, in resources as well. Cathcart also was aware of the continuity and the presence that he was in a place that had already been documented and a place that was filled with working class. Here we have San Francisco's Telegraph Hill, just two blocks up the hill from where he's living in the Montgomery block. And although these buildings do not any longer exist, um, they're the site of the current Deco building at 1350 Montgomery at Filbert. These are really the homes of the working class merchants and waterfront working people of San Francisco. Um, his photographs wind up being documentation. Uh, this being 1937-38, we see uh, sand-covered sidewalks, wooden plank, boardwalk. Uh, we see the building in the background uh, here and here. These actually are great points of continuity because when we go to the next photo, we see that same house and that same roof deck. And we see that this is Alta Street. This is the south side of Lower Alta. This is number 13 through 31. And all these buildings still exist today, despite at this time almost not being painted. These are all multi-million dollar homes today in a very, very Tony neighborhood. At this time, you can see there are no sidewalks. The streets and hills are sand covered with grasses. Cathcart was not oblivious to the fact that he was in an area that was both being lived in but had a history. Here we have an 1870 so photo of the exact same spot with the exact same buildings looking down Alta at Montgomery. These buildings still exist. Um, all of this is now part of a historic registry, but in 1870, uh, Curtis Watkins photographed this, and Watkins one of the most important landscapers, the, the mentor to Ansel Adams, and ultimately these images were not unfamiliar to Cathcart, as well as the map. So here we have a man who's aware, living in the middle of a community that has great history, um, and he's aware of both the photographic record as well as the mapping history. This map is the 1885 Chinatown map, and nothing on this map um, is unusual to us today, but at the time, this is the first map to ever color code a ghetto. People have their doctoral thesis on this, a ghetto being a restricted area of which one and only one ethnicity may and should remain. Uh, this is a time of segregation, and living outside of the boundaries of this map as an Asian American at all would have been very difficult, and as a Chinese American, almost impossible. As such, the land use is being determined, and if we look at the legacy, of uh, the impact of this map. It's a map that is familiar to everyone, but not often seen. And so it was included in the book because it is so important. The legend on the left-hand side um, reads in cursive writing, uh, prepared under the supervision of the Special Committee of the Board of Supervisors in July, 1885. Um, the Colors indicate as follows, general Chinese occupancy in tan, Chinese gambling houses in pink, Chinese prostitution in green, Chinese opium resorts in yellow, Chinese joss houses in red, and white prostitution in blue. Um, at Merritt's pointing out, nothing on this map is illegal. Everything on this map is immoral. And it is used as a post facto event uh, two years after the creation of the Chinese Exclusion Act, both uh, federally and as a state, um, to reinforce this legislation uh, through moral exclusion. So uh, we are blaming the Chinese for uh, the vices that are present here. Uh, it's not because they don't have a representation and there is no legal inclusion for them from this point on. Um, legislation of 1883 remained on the books um, in some form until 1965, but in its strongest form until 1943. And Americans born of Chinese ancestry were greatly impacted by this exclusion, despite being Americans, as well as all immigrants were. Cathcart then recognized there was a history after this map of Chinatown celebrating its own history. Here's an 1892 promotional map that celebrates and shows the businesses and shows every place and what they do and what they sell and who owns it. And it's beautiful and it's colorful and it's very, very celebratory. We also have a 1929 piece done by J.P. Wong, also funded by the six companies, which shows us a growth in Chinatown, an expansion in its boundaries. It shows us a Chinatown that now has uh, cousins over in the East Bay in Oakland, uh, has relationships with Marin, and most importantly, it has representation, and albeit horrific representation, it is in fact an immigration station at Angel Island. And the first part of being included is being counted. And through immigration and the exclusion thereof, the Chinese started to attain the process of being counted. And this process was better than the process before. 
Uh, and so it merits pointing out that this was an advance for the Chinese American community within California of greater representation and greater opportunity. And the map celebrates it as such. I'm showing land uses as the 1885 map does, uh, but in all positive forms of the commerce and industries present in Chinatown and its expanded boundaries. Um, with that comes the celebratory maps. In 1939, we have a fair in the middle of the bay called the Golden Gate International Exposition, or the GGIE. And with that comes the promotion of all things San Franciscan. And uh, Ethel Chung, in 1938, drew a map that was published for 39. And this was to bring people to Chinatown from that event, which people were coming from all over California and save the world, uh, to celebrate. Um, this would have been visible to Cathcart in his time and would have been an influence to him, understanding that, in fact, the official guide map to the GGIE, as represented here, done by Ruth Taylor, was also an illustrated or animated map. Uh, these are cartoon maps, and they uh, include often great whimsies and great colorful uh, events. And uh, this one, uh, we see a sea serpent in the upper right-hand side and uh, the China Clipper coming into land as that is Clipper Cove and was at the time the airport. Um, but Cathcart has recognized a style which will become his influence. And during the Second World War, he perfected that and by 1946 created his first map, uh, Old Downtown San Francisco. Uh, his second map, the uh, Bay Area in 1946. His third, the 1946 sketch map of California, which I'll be uh, doing my second book, will be about this map. Uh, this map on the uh, western side uh, recalls California history 1810 to 1840, the Rancho uh, colonialization period of the Spanish. Uh, and the eastern side of the map really represents the uh, gold region and gold rush history of 1848 to 1860. 70. So uh, an interesting map, and uh, like the Chinatown map, filled with great iconography, including tons of Chinese American history. His fourth map, in fact, was the Chinatown map, and it's the one I chose to do first because it was the least familiar to me as a San Franciscan and also the most interesting in regards to specificity. It had greater focus uh, on a specific location than any other map that he produced. Downtown was interesting, but it was really about old buildings and a plethora of history coming from 15 different directions. This story really is about the Chinese American diaspora within San Francisco and California as documented from 1848 to 1948. Um, we start chapter two, which is page 34, 35 in the book, with an explanation of the map with a breakdown as a legend. And what we see is an outer border of 26 images uh, that circle the map that discuss Chinese American history at large, and then the inner boundaries of A through G and one through nine, um, which contained spaces that defined proximity and regionalism of the Chinese American experience within San Francisco and the stories that made that up for the previous hundred years. Um, we have a typo at the beginning of chapter two, where it says 177 spaces, on Cathcart's map represents, and actually it's the 177 icons. The icons are each of these little images, and these are part of his scrapbooking, and these would have been drawn on a larger scale, and they're intended to be rather accurate and to depict a story enough with enough accuracy to instigate a conversation uh, to further explore the meaning of them. And that's essentially what I've done in the book, is Chinatown 101, um, to introduce the viewer to the stories that have been deemed important by the Chinese American community through their European uh, documentarian, um, what they want to promote. It's a 1947, the Second World War has just ended, San Francisco is opening up, the Chinese American community has just seen the Exclusion Act um, be repealed in great uh, influence in 1943, um, allowing all kinds of things, particularly education, uh, ownership of land. Um, and so these are the celebrations and the reasons and the impetus for the map. Uh, the outer border is a Chinese American life, uh, 1847 to 1947. And so this we see, and we start in the upper left-hand corner, and we have the Chinese Republic, and we have the Manchurian Empire. For 1947, the majority of people alive still would have had a direct relationship or understanding of the meanings of these flags and their origins and the political influences in the spheres of their world. The Chinese Republic is based on Sun Yat-sen, who lived in San Francisco, 1903 
um, and was at threat of from the Qin dynasty uh, because he was a revolutionary. Um, he wrote the Chinese Republic's constitution while in the Montgomery block at that time. He was befriended by Benny Bufano, great local artist. These are part of the documentations that Cathcart is interested in, and so he's included this because these are the supports of the community and where many people are coming from and fighting for or against. Uh, the Manchur Empire, we see that its date is different than the beginning of the Republic, and that's because the empire did not cede control right away and uh, retreated to the northeast of China and, and in 1912 did rescind power to the Chinese Republic, which remained in power till 1949. So our map is two years before the fall of the Chinese Republic to the communists. Um, but at this time, we're celebrating 10 10 parades. That's uh, October 10th, uh, the time of the creation of the Chinese Republic. And we still have 10 10 parades in my lifetime, well into the 80s, and we may today. With that, um, we go around the map a bit, and we see um, things that are evident with a, we have uh, an example of the flag. Today, we see the flag as the flag of Taiwan. At this time, this is the flag of the mainland Republic of China and Taiwan. Um, we also have homage uh, in the Chinese American community in the creation of the railroads, the lure of gold. These subject matters were covered the year before in his gold region map, and we'll cover them in the next book, but they are important to his influence and understanding of the community and the history which he is documenting at this time. Um, with it, we show a little insert of the gold region map, and we see that we have China camp, and we have uh, covered bridges. We have a little Joss house in the middle of the China camp representation. I didn't elaborate on what a Joss house is. A Joss house is a temple, and there are many of these in, in Chinatown that are family-owned. They often go around the family associations. Here he's making reference to C, D, F, and G, and these are the four trades or skills or jobs which people of Chinese descent may do. The Exclusion Act prevents people of Chinese descent from having any job other than these four jobs as a merchant, or as a laborer, or as a farmer, or as an educator or a scholar. These are the trades which are allowed under the Exclusion Act. And until the Exclusion Act is repealed, Working around this is one of the great goals. Fortunately, education is paramount to the Chinese American community and the pursuit of scholarly, scholarly pursuits is well respected and well documented. Um, Cathcart is using his photos uh, of taking photos of the neighborhood to create his imagery. And so we find that the photographic collection, which I had transferred from analog to digit, digitized um, over the course of three years. It took me to do those 3,500 photos, and it cost maybe 10 grand. Um, but it was worth it because we have those images and they're available online to review free of charge. And what we find is there are documentation as reference to the creation of his imagery to show what's important. An example would be his icon of the telephone exchange, um, which in fact really emulates a postcard as much as his photograph. Telephone exchange is very important. It's an example of the Chinese Exclusion Act working and to the benefit of the community in that this phone exchange, because of both language and exclusion, was required to be built for any commerce to be gone through the telephone to Chinatown. As a result, the women and men who worked here are incredible in their spatial knowledge and their understanding of the community, where they lived, who they were related to, where they were from, who they might come from, and the various dialects that they might speak, and be able to recall that within seconds because all phones are inbound and they need to be switched manually to a connection at the other end. And this process is really celebrated through the postcard and the history. And so Cathcart understands that this is a point of pride in the community, and it remained until automatic dial phones well into the 1940s uh, remained operational. Um, the spatial memory here is amazing. And the building still exists. I think it's a Bank of Canton today, and it's been modified. It was originally a post and timber structure brought over, built in Canton, and brought over for its dedicated purpose and use that it remains so until its conversion to a more modern structure. Um, we also see the children of Chinatown. Cathcart is documenting uh, an homage to the community. In 1903, Arnold Gente started photographing Chinatown in an effort to celebrate Chinatown, a community that up to this point in rent, written form and in print had been reviled since the 1870s as the bringers of all demonisms. 
at the end of the day, it was um, Gente who brought the first humanized photographs of the Chinese American community to the European American community and sensitizing a community to the plight and the joys and depth of a culture which was being both excluded and ignored. Um, Cathcart latched onto this and of course with his host B.S. Fong, he became quite close with many of the local merchants. These women would be in their 90s today uh, and ultimately many of uh, these people do uh, still live uh, and that we find uh, people are reaching out to us and saying that's my mom and that's my pop and it's nice to see um, he's really celebrating the community. He's celebrating the accomplishments and the parts that are worthy. Here we see a community which, despite being excluded through legislation for 50 years, in a union town, we see the ILGW unionizing a local 341 for the Chinese ladies' garment workers. It's a local union. So you don't have legal representation as a Chinese American, but you have a union who's watching your back. Uh, that's the 1940s and 1930s in San Francisco to a T. But it also shows uh, San Francisco's way of working around divisive and exclusive legislations. The uh, fact is, as many a Chinese American lived outside of Chinatown from the 19 teens on, and they lived with relative independence from many of the harassments that took place in Chinatown. Uh, at the end here, we have V. I've chosen this. We saw this photo earlier. The reason I have is it's the corner of Commercial and Grant Avenue, and the Mao Lico has on its walls here uh, a description of who they are and what they sell. Um, and all their wares out in front. And here we see uh, Arthur Sidham's uh, image, excuse me, Edward Sidham's image from Charles Doby's 1935 book on Chinatown um, with the exact same business front. Uh, and we see that in fact, the level of accuracy within this publication is part of the sincerity of the goal of promoting Chinatown in a favorable light. Uh, Chinatown is up to this point, its own community uh, at, held at arm's length. And so the effort to bother to try to have the level of accuracy and to include this uh, is a celebration and something that is recognized at the time. Cathcart has done the same on his map. We see it's from a little different perspective and he's taken some liberties uh, with the phonics and the signage. It's a bit of an abbreviation, but deemed as acceptable by his hosts. Uh, so again, we have a map maker who's aware of a pre-existence of both promotions and history of the community to celebrate and a pre-existence of documentation uh, from which he can draw in a favorable light. Uh, an example being almost everything we see here in the Pan Pacific International Exposition of 1915 promoting Chinatown. We in fact have the Hang Far Low restaurant and the Fancy Goods Bazaar store and things that in fact we see in the photographic record. Um, uh, important to celebrate the history of where we came from, uh, not just to the Chinese American community that celebrates its ancestry historically, but also this is a map that is created for the European American. It's created for the San Franciscan that is non-Chinese to understand and celebrate that which is right at arm's length. The chapter three is dedicated entirely to the contents of the map. That's A through G, one through nine. It's something close to, <clears throat> excuse me, 65 icons. Is that right? something like that. Uh, no, excuse me, 65 spaces with uh, 135 icons left. Um, it's a lot of stories. And the stories are um, sometimes concise and articulate, uh, sometimes vague and cryptic. It was, in fact, the crypticisms that drew me into the map. Uh, when I look at things and I don't know what they are, that's the best reason for me to go and continue further. The map has some very strong icons, one being right from the start, uh, we see the title. And within the title, when we blow it up this big, we see uh, men lined up on the right-hand side here, and we see horse-drawn cable cars. And what we actually see is a lot of smaller scale history uh, being inserted in this, and so we really have to pay attention. With it, uh, we start with Chinatown and the celebration of gaming. The Chinese American community uh, and the Chinese community has several games which are favorites and uh, 
some which are specific to Chinatown. The idea of a lottery, in fact, in this country was illegal. The only people who could do lotteries were those who didn't have legal representation, and sometimes churches who could do bingo or lotteries with some exception of rule. It sounds odd to anybody under 30 who's grown up with a lottery in every state, but lotteries didn't exist in this country until the mid-70s for the most part. They were a rarity. People would travel out of state to go get a lottery ticket. In fact, where I'm standing right now in Glen Ellen, California, is a piece of property that was part of a greater piece of property, and the family won in 1913, won the Chinatown numbers. And they bought this lot and the five other contiguous lots, and the family still owns the properties around us. Uh, Purcell Krieg is their name, and the Chinatown Lottery paid for the land I'm standing on right now. Um, not in my particular lifetime, but um, it was a lottery that paid out. Its postings were weekly, um, and you could play numbers, you could play events, and it was um, a true lottery. Uh, many lotteries didn't pay out. They were frauds. They were scams. Um, also within Chinatown, we have Fantan um, and Mahjong. These are quite regional games, and if you walk the back streets of Chinatown today, you'll still hear uh, these games being played. Uh, it's interesting, and what many people don't realize, although a little investigation <laughs> proves quite obviously, um, these are regional games with regional names for the terms of the die, of the pieces, and as such, um, they become regional uh, social houses uh, with the dialect of small towns being spoken within these gaming parlors uh, because the names of the pieces are the same and thus there are common history and commonality that, of course, is very reassuring to a person uh, not at home. Uh, and then finally, we have chess, a game that's thousands of years old and attributed to the Chinese and the Indians up in uh, heights of Nepal and Tibet, uh, but has been played and celebrated in the Chinese community and still is today. Um, a very important aspect of gaming and uh, entertainment within the Chinese community. Um, also, we see this, and this caught my eye, and it's one of the reasons that I actually did the Chinatown map was this giant moth. And in the original, I didn't originally see that the moth was in fact connected by a string to Portsmouth Square, and that it in fact is a kite. Um, in the book, we get to see that the kites and all of his icons are derived from real life. Here's a young man at Marina Middle School, uh, down there, uh, down in the marina, uh, with the kite, which is our example, uh, and likely purchased or handmade. Uh, would have been purchased perhaps at this shop on Grant Avenue that remained here till the 1980s and then moved to the wharf. Kites were very popular and a big part uh, of Chinese culture going back from original times for being used for relays of signals in wartime, uh, but being competitive, kite competitions are, were and still are very, very popular. Um, Cathcart also is celebrating the arts community. Here we have the statue of Sun Yat-sen produced by Benny Bufano. Um, Sun and Bufano being friends and associates. Um, we also see Don Kingman, great Chinese American, uh, born in Hong Kong, working in New York, San Francisco, and LA, and an office in the Montgomery block at the time Cathcart was there. So a good local hero. Uh, we also see uh, historical figures on the map. Uh, Little Pete, uh, Feng Chong, uh, was uh, the Duke of Vice. He was a man who started as a houseboy for a European family down in the peninsula and grew up uh, working for the six companies and then left there as a teenager and went to work for the Tongs. And by the time he was 30, was the leader of most vice in San Francisco. Um, there was a price on his head. He hired uh, a bodyguard, a man uh, who was called Lofan. Uh, Lofan, if you don't know the term, a uh, foreign devil, um, uh, uh, the laws were so stringent that he hired a white man because it was felt despite there being a price on his head, no one would dare attack a white man in an attempt to get to him. And so he felt it was an effective defense. A little Pete was killed in a barber chair uh, below the home he lived in on the corner of Waverly Place and Washington Street in uh, 1892. But the story is relevant and his story is very interesting and cryptic till still to this day, filled with vagaries, but important to the acknowledgements of the Chinatown of uh, the past. Uh, with it comes also uh, people of proximity. Um, he enjoyed Emperor Joshua Norton. Norton was a rice commodities broker um, who his home was at 624 Commercial Street. Well, I mention it because we're speaking of San Francisco Historical Society, and that would be the parklet two spaces up from their location in the Clay Street Mint today. Um, so, excuse me, the Commercial Street Mint today. Um, so uh, with Emperor Norton, we have a great local hero, 
um, who was vague and absolutely out of his mind, declared himself the emperor of the United States and protector of Mexico, um, and beloved by San Franciscans still to this day. Uh, so uh, the fact that his proximity was there on Commercial Street uh, was part of his inclusion, and most people did not know where he lived at 624 and thought he lived on Sacramento Street. So this is a point of, of uh, Cathcart's pride of showing what he knew. Excuse me. <coughs> Also, Cathcart documented historic contributors to the Chinese diaspora, uh, the 49ers. So in 49, there were Chinese immigrants here already, and they headed to the gold fields. And uh, prior to the Americanization of the gold fields, there were Chinese gold rush strikes. Um, but also the Chinese had water skills. The ability to mine, uh, to navigate and move water uh, was a skill that was not necessarily held by the Europeans. And so the contributions by the Chinese to this conversation were rather paramount uh, and not as highly documented as one might think. Also, we have the sex slave industry of the Chinese community. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and we have a slave girl. This is an image derived from Sidem's images of Chinatown, and it is rather romanticized and a bit glorified. The sex slave industry of Chinatown was horrific, and the, the sex pens and the slave sales in St. Louis Alley and in the streets of Chinatown in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s are well documented. By 1906, this trade had greatly ended, um, but we see that uh, such enslavement still exists today, and so uh, not just in Chinatown, uh, worldwide. And so it is something that merits acknowledgement um, and merits attention um, because the glossy, rosy image here um, doesn't belie the truth of the situation. Uh, I find those kind of romanticisms interesting within the map. And there are a few of these that we point out because they are, in the contemporary eye, either insensitive or uh, disrespectful, but they aren't intended as either. They're intended as acknowledgments to allow us to start to process what might otherwise be unprocessable. Um, with it also comes the celebration of the Chinese merchant of the 1850s. This will be the first class of Chinese immigrants to come with something more than just the shirt on their backs. They had some wealth and the ability to trade uh, and create wealth through the management of their industries. Um, this is very important to the industriousness of a community and the celebration of said industriousness still today is paramount. Cathcart recognized this. Um, he's paying homage to the traditionalism of it and we see a traditional type outfit and a gentleman with a queue. But we're also acknowledging everyday people. And here we see the documentation of the modern slit skirt, something that he's actually seeing uh, on the street that day. And it's derived and explained well in the book. Um, there are many photographs, uh, like this one along Waverly Place, of contemporary businesswomen um, in very modern outfits. And this is quite noticeable within the community of Chinatown for 1937 to 1945. Um, we're also acknowledging such things as fresh food, remembering that something like Trey Man, a man delivering food, is novel. Uh, food delivery was exclusively a Chinese advent, and until the delivery of pizza in this country in the late 1960s, food delivery didn't really exist outside of Chinatown. The Chinese community used food delivery because of the Exclusion Act. Many people worked arduous 12 to 15 hour days and did not have the time to eat. And so food was brought to them at their time and purchase on their request. And this was a norm and is still a norm. The idea of delivery dim sum is still commonplace. But Trey Man, we can see documented in a dozen to two dozen photographs in Cathcart's collection. And this is a very common scene along Grant Avenue and Jackson Street. Um, we also see celebration of the family buildings. So the map itself is paying homage to the community at large and the family buildings along Waverly Place, also known as Pike Place. Nobody calls it that anymore. We all call it Waverly Place. We have the Wong family building, the Lee family building. We have um, uh, the oldest temple, Buddhist temple in the United States. Uh, we have acknowledgement of the origins of the community and the families that are instrumental in keeping the community cohesive. Um, here, he's also aware that he's in an area that's been documented before. Here's a photograph of Waverly Place from 1892. At the end, we see the Chan family building on uh, Washington Street uh, facing us, and on each side, we see the businesses of Waverly Place. 
here's his photograph, a little bit different perspective, but again, the Chan family building at the end on the right, um, that building has since been replaced and is a very similar but larger building to the Chan family building. We see the one on the left has a date of 1920, had just been re replaced and upgraded 15 years earlier or 20 years earlier. Um, we also see schools and hospitals and places of import to the Chinese community. Success is through education and hard work. Education of a number of people my age who went to Commodore Stockton School or were born in the Chinese hospital are great and numerous. And these were the standards of the community and that these were created by the Chinese American community for their use exclusively at a time of segregation. This hospital was paid for by benevolences and donations of Chinese Americans from the days of its inception until today. It's been recently replaced by a structure 10 times greater and larger to continue that work. But this building was unique in that it was a private hospital within a city that excluded anyone Excuse me, it failed to exclude anyone despite its origins of being a Chinese hospital, meaning Chinese Americans went here because they couldn't go elsewhere, but they did not exclude others from coming here should they need assistance. This was a very important part of the dynamic of the Chinese hospital and still is part of their mission statement. We also have the communities of the churches, Old St. Mary's, that would have been the Catholics within and here, of course, at that time, that was the gateway to Chinatown. Everything south on Grant Avenue from California south, um, California Street south on Grant, was actually Japantown. And the majority of the residents and owners there were Japanese Americans, also required to live in Chinatown as Asian Americans under the Exclusion Act. This changed some, and the Japanese Americans moved out to the Fillmore starting in the 20s. And with Article 41 in 1941, the Japanese were removed and interned. This process, of course, is a dark part of San Francisco's history, but a big part of a segregated city and something that many people aren't fully aware of and where and how all of this transpired. But it's important to point out for Chinatown, the gates of Chinatown were in fact Sing Fat and Sing Chong across the street from St. Mary's and that California Street North was interpreted as Chinatown and the gateway was in fact these buildings. It isn't until that gift um, from, I believe, Hong Kong or Taiwan to us uh, of the Bush Street gate uh, that now really represents it for us. Also with that, we have the celebration of theater and culture. Um, here we have a shot of the inside of the Mandarin Theater. Mandarin Theater, of course, on Grant Avenue, uh, showing opera and the celebration of food. This is where Cathcart uh, really hung out and where he and his friends celebrated Chinatown and the community greatly. Living in the Montgomery block, he didn't have a kitchen and he ate out a lot. And we see that. We also see that the pursuit of democratic freedoms and the freedom of expression, freedom of the press, is very important in Chinatown. And there are in excess of a half a dozen locally owned, locally produced newspapers discussing the affairs of the world and the affairs of the Chinese American within the United States. Uh, and it's an important uh, point and topic, uh, just in that many of these newspapers actually still exist. Um, Chinhua Li and the Chinese Digest on Cameron Alley is documented. We also importantly have Dr. Poon Chu and the, uh, the importance here is that Dr. Poon Chu had the Chung Sai Yat Po newspaper starting in 1900, started in LA. And of course it was distributed throughout the Chinese American community within the United States. And his advocacy for the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act and his advocacy for the support of Dr. Sun Yat Sen and his Chinese, Chinese Democratic Republic and the Chinese Constitution, which was written under the auspice of democracy, was paramount to his program. And ultimately, it was his writings with the support of the community that eventually led to the repeal in 1943 of the greater part of that act. Um, I think it's paramount that a map that is showing stories and celebrations and good and bad is very focused on the freedoms um, that have been denied and granted to a community at large. And the documentation of that is very thorough. 
Um, we also have generalizations and just, I, I grabbed this snippet of Washington Street uh, at Waverly Place, because here we see uh, the old bulletin board. That's where your lottery number would have been announced. It's where the tongs announced if there was a price on somebody's head. Um, it's where uh, all information uh, would have been conveyed at a time when you just stop by and take a look. Um, next to it was the first Chinese laundry being celebrated. On the other side, we see the Peace Society in abbreviation. Created in 1913, it was the result of the Tong Wars of the 1880s and 90s and the desire to create a peaceful resolution to these conflicts about the management of vice within Chinatown. Without representation by Western law and, and American law enforcement, Chinatown was on its own. And with that, their own enforcements and own legislations took precedent. And this is the Peace Society represents that to some degree. Also, we see the dates of 1892. That happens to be the spot and the time at which Little Pete was killed. So it's just, here's a snippet of a corner. And what we see is five or six or seven different historical stories, so many and so many different directions. This is the kind of depth and richness that, that I'm trying to articulate in the book. Um, the symbolism, sometimes it's pretty obvious, something like double happiness, something like uh, prosperity, uh, the symbolism of jade and its importance within the culture. These are things that Cathcart is using as embellishments and an aesthetic, but also the importance of the symbolism within the community and understanding it is paramount to uh, a generous uh, perspective into understanding the culture at large, um, including things like ethics. We have the old Podi, and it was spoken of in Sidem's and Gobi, excuse me, <clears throat> in Charles Doby's 1935 book on Chinatown, he discusses the old Podi, and it is in fact this building on the corner of Clay and Grant. And we look at it and see that it is empty, and in fact it has been empty since 1932 and remains empty until 1958, and it is a result of a curse being placed on it where the landlord had done an injustice to the tenant and the tenant had been somehow wronged. And until that injustice was rectified or clarified or remedied, no one would rent the space. And that's how it remained for over 20 years. Um, these are things about ethics. These are things about community. And these are things about doing the right thing um, when there's no legal requirement for you to do so. Um, this wasn't wasted on Cathcart. Also, I like this photograph because we can see right where it is. In his typical form, we have a street sign, we have a car, we have uh, road signs, and we have um, all kinds of identifying things. We know it's Hang Far Low right over there. We see the Chop Suey House. We see it's Clay Street. We see the storefront is to let. And if we look even closer, we can see the license plate on the car coming down the street, but it's a 1939 photograph because he has a, uh, a 1939 GGIE license plate. Um, this is the severity and the intensity with the Cathcart is documenting this community. And so for people growing up in this community or people who are derived um, historically from here, this is an excellent insight into the life that our parents and our grandparents lived physically. Um, I find it really, really rewarding to look at the photographs and to uh, remind myself and then to go down and walk the neighborhood, which is just a couple blocks from our store. Cathcart is also acknowledgement, uh, acknowledging the underworld. And the underworld is the world of vice and the world of exploitation. This particular image I've derived, and it's the entrance to Waverly Place at Sacramento Street, and is specifically, in my mind, referencing the 1887 hatchet wars that took place on Waverly Place, where five families fighting it out for control of vice hired their high binders, which were men to fight on their behalf. And with their weapons, they all descended upon Waverly Place and started hacking the hell out of each other. 19 people died. 37 people were injured, and 75 people were arrested. Uh, it was a monumentous event that captured the imagination of the press and uh, ultimately was fairly well documented, but it also facilitated a change and an insight and a greater scrutiny and exclusion of the Chinese community as a result. So these underworld trappings were something that was very evident. Here we see the Mansion House. Mansion House was a famous brothel, 1870s to 1913 when, uh, or 1917, when the legislation within the state of California made prostitution illegal. It was up to that time not illegal, um, but we see a woman uh, half dressed and half exposed in front of the Mansion House. Here I actually have, and included in the book, is Madame Lazarine and Ladies, 730 Commercial Street, 
prostitution. This is, in fact, a card for the mansion house, um, which is part of my uh, collection and fun to have and fun to include in the book. Um, but a famous place that wasn't shy about advertising its wares and sales. Also, the underground Chinatown. So this was a Chinatown that was the connection of sidewalks and the connection of uh, basements uh, for both the legitimate and illegitimate use and exploitation of people and goods. Um, the, much of this was destroyed in the Oak Six earthquake and fire, and much of it was not rebuilt, but much of it still exists still today. My sidewalk on Upper Grant Avenue still connects to the houses to the north and south of us, and in many cases that's still evident in many places in Chinatown. Not to the degree that it used to be. It used to be you could come in one block and come out three blocks later, uh, and that was uh, in part a response to if you can't go out on the street without getting harassed, then you don't go out on the street. But if you've got to go down to the store and get goods, well, this was a way that that could facilitate. Also, all of the opium resorts and all of the gaming took place in the majority of basements because these were activities that on occasion would be raided. And when they were, people needed to escape. And so these escape routes were predetermined so that there was a cacophony of ways to get out from any specific location. Um, we also have reference to the opium industry uh, which existed and still exists today. Um, we also have great crypticisms, something like this that says GE and it looks like an outhouse. It's on uh, Montgomery Street. And, and that just as a research, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, eventually you just start looking and you start looking and, and you have your assistant looking and everybody's looking. And, and eventually you discover that the, documentation of it is actually a photograph. Here's a photograph Kraftkart took of that very building and that very location. So then you start showing the photograph around. I show it to Bill Stout Architectural and go, Bill, what was here? And he goes, well, that's where Maynard Dixon's studio was. I thought, oh, well, that's a good reason. Maynard Dixon, the important Western muralist, the husband of Dorothea Lange, great San Francisco artist, great tidbit, entirely fascinating. Not the answer. Oh, it's where the Washington Broom Company was. This is one of the few companies that's Chinese owned that's outside of Chinatown and they did this and they had overalls on. Nope, that's not the story either, although it's a great story. Uh, it turns out that this is the location of Bret Hart's Golden Era newspaper and the site where Bret Hart and Mark Twain wrote for newspapers within San Francisco. And this would have been a great influence and a great importance to Cathcart. He moved here to become an author. And so the literary community and its existence and proximity were something that he really wanted to immerse himself in and did for the bulk of his life. And so this really is a celebration of the golden era, Bret Hart's 1860s newspaper where Mark Twain worked. And it would have been excuse me, in fact, in this very building, because this building is an 1858 building. So uh, the documentation eventually comes, but that took us maybe a year to figure that one out. Um, we also have direct literary influences, and, and this is one of the reasons we're able to figure some things out is because of what influenced him was being celebrated. Here we see Old Chinatown uh, by Gente and Irvin. This is a 1908 book I mentioned that had the photographs of the Chinese American community in traditional clothing, which for the first time humanized this community for the European Americans to be uh, in a non judgmental, adoptive, and a supportive role for the first time. In 40 years. Um, we also have Dobie's uh, Chinatown, as well as uh, randomly uh, something that says the first book printed in California in shorthand. <clears throat> I'll take a moment to just kind of discuss Cathcart. Cathcart prided himself on being a good researcher and he wanted to correct fallacies and misconceptions and inaccuracies about San Francisco history. Well, we all know a number of people like that in our life. And as lovers of history, we know another historian who wants to get it right. And he's always right. Um, and it's, that's, there's nothing the matter with that. Um, but we can never always be right. And uh, ultimately, here's a situation where Cathcart has made an incredible endeavor. And I think he got confused with his own notes and research. Because what we have is an X with a book next to it. And the book says Life in California. Well, Life in California is, in fact, a book about California life. But... It was not the first book printed in California. Life in California was printed in Brooklyn, New York. And I believe Life in California was printed in Brooklyn, New York in 1848. So that's not correct. But where the X is, is on number eight, Clay Street, 
Well, that's the site where Washington Bartlett, first American alcade of San Francisco, had a publishing company and published the first book in English called California As It Is and As It Should Be by a man by the name of Zach Shusky, and who in the Grabhorn Press reiteration of that book in 1935, the foreword for the book was done by another great literary. And the conversation is about who was this guy and why do we know nothing about him? So Cathcart got the location correct, but the book wrong. He got the timing correct. Technically, the first book printed in California would have been in Spanish. It would have been 1835. It would have been published by Zamorano, and it would have been the Manifesto of the California done by uh, Juan Jesus Figueroa in his disavowment of the handing over of mission lands to the rancho holders like Mariano Vallejo, um, because ultimately they were to be returned to the native peoples, yet that concept being foreign to them, the rancho people didn't allow it. And Figueroa wrote this manifesto to disavow his responsibility and to also acknowledge his failure to the native peoples of California in this context. That's the first book printed in California, and it's printed in Spanish, if you ever want to win a trivia cast. The first printed in English in California is Life As It Is and As It Should Be, and it was printed at number eight, Wash, uh, Clay Street. So that's what he's referencing, but Cathcart got it wrong. So despite being a pedantic, thorough, and competent researcher, he could still get confused. And I think it's an important lesson to take away for me, because I'm always trying to get it right, but you don't always get it right. So also a great influence for Cathcart and a side project. This map is in fact an amalgam of two projects, a celebration of the Montgomery Block and the Barbary Coast and a celebration of Chinatown and the Chinese American community. And he wrote two books about this that didn't do well. So he took his crib sheets and he made it into a map. And that's what we have here. So the proximity of the Barbary Coast to Chinatown is celebrated within this map. And it's important because in the middle of it, we see Cathcart is living right here in the Montgomery block. And over here, this is all Barbary Coast. And over here, up above, that's all Chinatown. But if we look at this area, this is predominantly all San Francisco history, non-Chinese American, dating from 1850 to 1915 or 1950. Um, it's really about where he lives and what he sees every day. This little image, it says, Barbary Coast, past and present, one horse shea. So if we look down at the bottom here, there is a small pile of rubble. And what it's about is a marvelous ditty uh, about a man who had a shea, a, a, a horse-drawn carriage that he was very proud of. And it lived to be 100 years old, this horse-drawn carriage, not the horse, but the carriage. And he loved it and he took care of it until one day it was so fatigued and so exhausted, the carriage just fell apart into a thousand pieces. It fell to the ground. Well, that story evoked a building, which is now a vacant lot on the corner of Sansom and Jackson. And that vacant lot is still there. But in 1938, the building fell down as a result of its steam heat system failing and the boiler blowing through the roof. And it, it did such a severe impact to the building that it caved in upon itself. And it's today still a vacant lot, 70, 80 years later. Um, this was the edge of what was the financial district moving up to Broadway, and it actually wound up stopping there. So all of this Barbary Coast that he has documented, in fact, still exists today. Many of the buildings going down Pacific Ave, and these structures still exist. And the street scene doesn't look too different despite the automobiles or the inclusion of shade trees today. Um, it's a place worthy of walking around and looking at. Um, the photographic collection has both collections of this as well as Chinatown. Here's some of the wood carving that was on the front of the Hippodrome. This is known as Nymphs and Satyrs. These were such incredible wood carvings. They were celebrated in writings for the previous 50 years and they were still on the buildings well into 1940, 42. Sometime during the war, they disappeared. Um, we also have daily life for the artist documented on the map. And so what we have, we see Papa Copa's number one and number two. Well, Papa Copa's was on the corner. That's where Jack London hung out. Papa Copa's number two. Well, that's where Dobie and Sidem hang out. Um, Bonini's barn. That's where Cathcart has breakfast every day. The Philosopher's Inn. So this is in fact really about life around the Montgomery block and his aspirations as a literary giant uh, and the people that he was hanging around with and the places he was doing that. So the story at large 
is well documented. It's 160 pages um, filled with iconography, supported by the photographs created by the original author from his original research, um, as defined by us for your interpretation. I would love to hear from anyone who has any contributions or information or any insights into what they see. Um, this book will have multiple printings in that it's timeless. Um, it is not a book that will become dated because the story is timeless and its approach has been to use um, the information available to us in our archive, um, which is now available to the public online through our website free of charge. Anything you want to buy, you may, but there's no obligation to do so. And I think it's important to, to celebrate the history, to be able to have those resources. So thank you for your time and attention. That pretty much covers my covering of Gold Mountain Big City, um, Ken Cathcart's book on San Francisco's Chinatown circa 1947. Jim, your presentation was wonderful. You've done a huge service to the city by illuminating what's in this wonderful map. And I just want to thank you for all the research and time you took to put it together. And uh, I myself am bursting with questions, but I won't take up everyone's time with them now. Maybe you and I can talk offline. Did you mention where people can purchase the book? No, of course I didn't. I'm the worst businessman. Um, <laughs> there are a couple of places. Uh, you can, of course, get it on Amazon. Uh, you can, there's a link on our website, Shine and Shine, which is our store, uh, which connects you to uh, any bookstore uh, has it, and they uh, are doing mail order these days. Uh, Amazon, of course. I bought uh, one from Powell's uh, up in Portland. I got one from Argosy. I wanted to try the system, so uh, and they all delivered, and they're all happy to provide it. Um, uh, if you want to buy one from me and have it signed, shoot me an email, um, and we can facilitate that through our website, and I'll uh, send off a signed copy. Um, so there are any number of sources. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Fabulous. Well, thank you again for taking the time. I think that um, our members and the people who view, view this will absolutely love it. And uh, I is, uh, renewed my interest in sort of exploring all the haunts in the back alleys of Chinatown, too, where, uh, as you mentioned, our San Francisco Historical Society's museum is sort of ground zero to the, the map on commercial and, uh, and, uh, and Kearney and Montgomery. So um, thank you again, and um, hopefully you and I will talk again soon. Indeed, I look forward to it. Thank you, Lana, okay. and thank you, San Francisco Historical Society. So see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay,